Thank you, Jessica. Okay, well, welcome folks to the first of the ISTEP seminar series. ISTEP is the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineers, Engineering's newest department. It stands for the Institute for Studies in Transdisciplinary Engineering Education and Practice, quite the acronym. ISTEP's foci are engineering education, transdisciplinary competencies, and engineering practice. So Lydia Wilkinson and I are the seminar co-chairs, and we benefit hugely from the support of Natalia Smith in getting these seminars running. Um, thank you, Jessica, so much for opening up with this much. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which the University of Toronto operates, the land where I live and work from today, where I'm joining from. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I want to add that today I'm grateful, I'm ready, I'm open, and I'm curious to hear what our guest speaker will share with us. I personally feel a huge opportunity to take what I learned today and pass it on in my capacity as a leader and an engineer. In fact, just 10 minutes ago, I was teaching manufacturing to 200 undergraduate students. That's just this huge opportunity to, to influence our, our students. And also this year I became a PNG myself. And so I really feel um, ready to hear this. And so I'm thrilled to be welcoming Professor, Professor Jessica Vandenberg as our first speaker in this series. Jessica Vandenberg, PNG, MSc, is born of the Dene Ta First Nation and raised in a very inclusive German family in Northern Alberta. Jessica is an Indigenous professional engineer, industrial professor, and the Assistant Dean, Engineering Community and Culture at the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Alberta. She also contributes to Truth and Reconciliation, acting as a bridge to Indigenous communities, talks to calls to action implementation, and works on TRC awareness through her consulting company. She is a mother of two and is passionate about equity, diversity, and inclusion. She sits on many boards and councils, walks in many governance worlds, and does her best to contribute to the development of well-rounded and ethically-minded engineering students who will ultimately build strong and vibrant communities within Canada. And so at the end of Professor Vandenberg's talk, we'll uh, ask for questions, so please keep them in mind. We'll do a Q&A at the end, but um, at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Jessica. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I'll just share my screen here. There we go. All right, so I'd also like to just open with a land acknowledgement because uh, obviously I'm not with you folks today, but today finds me on the traditional territory Treaty 6 in Métis Nation zone number four here in Edmonton, Alberta. And it's always an honor and a privilege to acknowledge um, the Indigenous peoples who've walked this land for thousands of years and many centuries. Um, but also I'd like to acknowledge land spirit itself. Land spirit is our relation and she has nourished and protected us and embraced us um, since the beginning of time. And that um, deserve a, deserves a place of honor. And often Indigenous people have acted as stewards towards land spirit, looking after her um, listening to her voice, taking her lessons and, and, and sharing them um, outward into, into other places. And so I just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge both the Indigenous peoples of the land, but also land spirit itself. And so for, again, from my heart and spirit to yours, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. So normally if we were in person, um, I'd be wearing my ribbon skirt to share some of these teachings that we're having today. Um, just to acknowledge um, Faith Starlight of Pow Wow Style, she designed this for me. Um, she really um, listened to my story and came up with this beautiful creation. Um, she includes in it um, an honoring to the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, um, the medicine wheel. Um, I think a lot on the hundreds of teachings that go into the medicine wheel, how to learn how to walk in a good way and walk in balance. I honor my profession of being an engineer with the gear wheel. Mountains for me are the place that really ground me in humility, uh, remind me that I'm only here for a short amount of time and that I need to really think about uh, what impact I can have and who I walk with and how I um, approach life and appreciate um, the cycle for the time that I'm here. Um, 
mountains also for me are just so inspiring and re-energizing. That's the place where I go to, um, to really um, find that spark of life again. Um, and I, I'm so excited that here in Alberta, it's ski season. That's where I spend a lot of time on top of the mountains. I honor the seasons and I honor um, the sun and the moon and the cycles that they bring. Um, I align a lot with bear spirits. Um, my daughter, I honor, um, she aligns very much with hummingbird spirits, uh, just so full of love and compassion and bringing it everywhere. Uh, my son is the wolf for sure, walks on his own, uh, but is very loyal to his pack um, and is a leader at heart and he loves to howl. Um, I honor my birth nation, Deneta, with the five um, petaled flower as well. So. Um, I just wanted to share that as well, as well throughout these conversations. I don't know where all of you are in your truth and reconciliation journeys. I'm not here to perpetuate or um, have you leaving with any feelings of shame, blame, or guilt. Um, we're just simply talking about the truth and the reality of the situations and where we're at and uh, what part we can play. As well, again, not knowing all of your stories. Um, I'm very always aware of people's triggers. Um, and so if there's anything that triggers you, please do your self-care, reach out to any mental and emotional health supports uh, that are available to you, and, and please check on each other um, just in case there is anything that's triggering. I also, in efforts in support of decolonization within the larger world, um, things like the United Nations, Indigenous um, people, um, the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous Rights of People, UNDRIP, um, recognize that there are many countries where human rights aren't fully actualized, uh, that there's a lot of oppress oppression and decolonization that's happening around the world. And so um, universities are often um, international little hubs. So I just wanna recognize that uh, we could have folks in the audience that come from uh, uh, countries uh, that are undergoing decolonization as well. And I don't wanna dishonor your story or your journey because it's very similar to Indigenous Peoples of Canada. Uh, but today we're here to talk about Indigenous Peoples of Canada. And all of that is just to work towards common understanding. And I'm just so happy and grateful that you are joining me today and making this part of your personal and professional journey. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about understanding the role of professional engineers, um, uh, grounding a little bit of understanding of what is equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization. And then we're gonna work towards that self-awareness um, so that you can be open to understanding Indigenous peoples here in Canada. All right, so um, let's start at the beginning a little bit around what is engineering. So it's always, I'm always curious to ask folks to think about what this is. Um, working in uh, STEM outreach for, for decades now, as well as um, being the director of enforcement and permits for APEGA, the engineering regulator here in Alberta, we lived and breathed in the legal definition of what is engineering. So it's always, I'm always curious to hear what people think. Oops, sorry about that. Um, what is engineering? Often you'll hear people describe it maybe as a task. Somebody was doing engineering, maybe a job. I am a chemical engineer, a career. Um, I am a professional engineer, part of a a group of colleagues that have similar backgrounds to me. It's part of a profession. Um, and sometimes I hear that people think of it as a mindset, um, that it is an expansion of the scientific method. It's a different way of applying and thinking and innovating and creating. Um, and so sometimes I hear people say that they think it's a mindset. When it comes to the legal definition, um, this is only a portion of it, but it's really that application of math and science to plan, design, evaluate, construct, maintain, or operate any structure, work, or process. Um, engineering as a, as a degree is, is very, very broad. The definition is very, very broad. And so when you think through to disciplines of engineering, how many do you think there would be? And please open your chats. Uh, I think everyone has the ability to pop uh, answers into the chat. Um, if you do, uh, how many disciplines of engineering do you think there are? And um, everyone knows a lot of the common ones, um, chemical, electrical, mechanical, hundreds, yeah, 300, 400. So within Canada, um, there's over 44 different disciplines offered by the accredited Canadian universities. But of course, in the international world, there are many offered at um, the international universities as well. So quite a few different, um, different areas. 
So engineering is very broad is, is what I'm trying to get at with this one. But what binds us all together? Well, we all work in the interest of not ourselves, but we're working for the greater good. All of us are bound by a code of ethics that tells us to work in the public interest. And so um, I spent a lot of time reflecting on what that means, work in the public interest and working for the greater good. Um, because without ethics, of course, we can get lost in the math and science. And so I, I always like to share this one. It says, um, don't look at me like that. My team only um, created the jet propulsion system and that appears to be functioning perfectly. So technology within the wrong hands, of course, um, can turn a different way and not always a good way. So thinking about really um, the ethics of it is the other grounding part that will add and complement your, um, your technical area of practice. So here in, in Alberta, we follow APEGA's code of conduct. Um, of course, where you're joining from, you'll have a different provincial code of conduct, but they all have the same kind of tenets um, that they're grounded in. So the first, of course, is wholly paramount that health, safety, and welfare of the public and have regard for the environment. So it's not just people, we need to think about the environment and thinking back to my land acknowledgement, I acknowledge land spirit. Um, as Indigenous people, we follow, um, we follow the tenant of all my relations. That means thinking of all of our um, brothers and sisters and cousins that we consider um, in the where we go. So it's not just people to people, it's also animals, it's also plants, it's trees, it's birds, it's moons, it's the stars, it's the planets, um, it's water spirit, all of those are our relations as well. And so often we need to be the voice for those who don't have a voice at the table. The second uh, code of conduct is uh, making sure that we work in areas that we're competent um, in. So this is really about your degree and your training that you have, that you stay within your playground of what you're trained to do. So me, I was trained as a chemical engineer, computer process control, working in the instrumentation area. I would never go off and, and do aerospace engineering. I don't know how to do that. But with adequate training and mentorship and growth, um, I could shift my practice of scope over there, um, but also be able to show that. Conduct themselves with integrity, honesty, fairness, and objectivity in their professional activities. This is really much about behavior and action. So are we walking the talk? Um, are, we actually, um, are we actually behaving in a way that, uh, that grounds us in the values that we believe in? Um, again, um, I follow the seven sacred teachings, love, respect, truth, honesty, humility, courage, and wisdom. And I walk with those every day um, and that allows me to really walk in a good way. And so conducting myself both at work as well as outside of work is something that I take a lot of pride in because for me, walking in a good way um, leads to better relationships. It leads to better communication. It leads to better um, ability to build teams that we can truly get down to the work that we believe in um, and that we are trained to do. Um, the fourth one is comply with applicable statutes, regulations, and bylaws in their professional practices. So understanding the regulation and the rules that are in your area and uphold and enhance the honor and dignity and reputation of their professions. And so it's very similar from province to province and up to the territories as well around this ethical behavior. Um, and so the real tenant um, that ties to Indigenous ways that I want to also bring into the conversation is the Cree Plains teaching of Wakotawin. Each nation teaches this and has different teachings and different words for it. But this is the idea of interconnectedness. This idea that um, I as an individual um, am part of a family. The family is part of a community. Those communities are part of a nation. But we also bring into the conversation um, all of our relations. So all of our relations in the natural environment, as well as a tie to the spirit world. So walking with the medicine wheel, um, we spend a lot of time in thinking about our, our spiritual path, our spiritual balance, uh, our spiritual selves, because it's on a spirit to spirit interaction that we have connection. Um, so at the beginning, you heard me say, um, from my heart and spirit to yours. I'm here talking from um, a spiritual level to spiritual level. And so this idea of a win is really thinking about um, cause and effect. Everything that I do and say 
and don't say and don't do has an impact on you. That has an impact on my family, has an impact on the community and nation and national and uh, natural environment into the spirit world. And so um, really, really um, what professional engineers need to understand is when we think about working in the public interest and working for the greater good is that every decision that we make, every conversation that we make, um, people are trusting us to understand that impact. And so we impact the public. Um, and often, of course, all of the public aren't um, invited to our uh, project design meetings and aren't designed to our planning meetings. So we really need to think about how we are the voice for those who aren't at the table. And that could be in risk assessments or planning or designs, but that means we need to have and be open to um, understanding diverse demographics. Do we need to be the experts in all of this? No. Uh, but we need to be able to give pause and ask the question around, well, are we considering this demographic? And if we're not, let's consider it. Let's go ask them. Let's invite them to the table. But this is not limited for demographics amongst just people. It's also being the voice for the environment and the animal and the plant perspectives in the ecosystem. And so um, this gives rise um, again, that there is need for attraction and retention of diversity into the engineering profession. Um, and so that we have different voices at the table. We have a diversity of perspectives, a diversity of experiences, especially since we work and live and thrive in an international world. Um, I am a lover of travel. I've traveled all over the place, um, a lot extensively through Europe and New Zealand and I've dived under the oceans and stood on top of mountains and stood at Machu Picchu and Stonehenge and stood in all these places, um, marveled at architecture, uh, architecture that's just uh, phenomenal and um, create like so, so many structures that were built centuries ago. Um, and what I have learned from that is that of course, everybody has a lot of different experiences. And um, when we build and do projects at an international level, when we do projects um, that are that are for a country that is truly open to international folks, um, it's important that we take into mind the different, um, the different uh, implications of what we're doing on those diverse perspectives. And so we know diversity within the engineering profession isn't ideal. When we look at the one identifier of the gender type, um, and this is male, female, we know there's a number of different uh, gender demographics that aren't included in this graphic. Um, we know that um, females in Canada make up about 50% of the population. Actually, I think it's a little bit higher, 51%. Um, but that representation isn't in the engineering professions. We're sitting at around the 24% mark for student enrollment within a PEGA at the professional uh, registration level. It's around the 18% mark. So not even close to the 50% mark. When we look at demographics at the University of Alberta here, uh, where our students are coming from, we have quite a few domestic, of course, from within Canada, but quite a few from outside of Canada as well, so 15%. But when we look at the demographic of Indigenous people, um, there's less than 1% within, within um, our student population. So what does that tell me? That tells me that we don't always have uh, diverse voices um, available to be at the table. And so we, we concentrate and work on things like attraction and retention into the professions. We know um, that everybody has a capability. We know there's tons of studies saying uh, female gender has a strong math ability, strong science ability. Uh, they just need the support system around them to make it through the professions and, and stay there. Indigenous people, um, I know so many talented um, Indigenous STEM professionals. Um, there are quite a few of us. We gather under ACES um, in North America, and there's hundreds and hundreds. The capability is there. Um, it's not that, um, um, that the capability is missing. It's just that there are often barriers to getting into um, the STEM professions. All right, so diversity. Uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, decolonization. I just wanna shift the conversation just to define what this means. So again, professional engineers, as part of our ethical obligations, uh, we work in the public interest. We need to understand diverse demographics. Diversity is really about 
appreciating everybody for who they are at this moment, uh, whatever their experience may be. Um, inclusion is about building the spaces so diverse people feel, um, everybody in their authentic selves feels like they belong in that space. Equity is very much about building systems and policies and frameworks um, that fit to that person and their needs so that they can thrive in their environment. Um, and decolonization, again, is that um, living in this international world, there are large groups of demographics that have been oppressed in terms of human rights and, and other, um, other tactics within those countries. Um, and understanding that pieces of that need to be um, healed, number one, um, and that they, they may walk with complex PTSD like Indigenous Peoples of Canada do, um, or they come with very different um, normals, um, for lack of a better word, coming into this country. And so how do we build the systems um, to support folks from places of oppression? That's what decolonization is about. But it all comes down to identity, right? And thinking about how we identify when we come, when, when, when we come to the point of wanting to appreciate um, diversity. And so let's think about a person. So this is, this is my engineering equation. We, we, need our, we need our equations, right? So a person is a function of their genetics, how they're bio, biologically made up. You heard in my introduction that I'm a 60 scoop survivor. So what that means is that I was put into the foster adoption system. I've met my birth family and I formed a relationship with them, but um, that was well into my adult life. But um, growing up um, as someone who was adopted, uh, I was always curious about what part of me is hardwired into my um, biology and what part is learned from the environment around me. So there's things that are, that are in me that are part of genetics. Um, but you are also made up of the experiences that you've had up to the present day. You're made up of the values and belief systems that you've formulated um, around you. I grew up in a pretty strict Catholic household. Um, so the values and beliefs um, were ingrained into everything that we did. Um, I've since taken a different spiritual journey and come to a different place, um, practicing outside the Catholic faith, um, but still elements of it resonate because the values are the same. Um, your product of how they were raised. So I grew up in rural Alberta. The closest town was 67 people, so a very small town, um, which is a very different experience than someone who was raised, say, in a very large metropolis city like uh, Los Angeles or um, Honolulu or, or something like that. You're a product of your environment, so what you eat every day, the habits that you have, who you surround yourself with, what you read, um, what you see, social media is playing a big, a big factor in environment uh, these days as well. And, and of course it triggers stress and mental health um, and emotional health. Um, and it has a factor in on so many pieces of yourself. And then of course that you're also a product of uh, the community and people you surround yourselves with. So all of this makes up who you are and who you are um, and how you identify. So again, um, with equity, diversity, inclusion, we're trying to really find that sweet spot in the middle where we grow places of belonging. Um, for me, again, growing up in rural Alberta, uh, where there was very few Indigenous people in the schools that I went to, um, I didn't ever feel like I belonged. Um, I would walk through the places um, and always it would be an air of being singled out, an air of exclusion, um, not being invited to things, um, sitting alone a lot to no one wanting to sit with me. And as a child in development stages that um, took its toll, of course. But when, we, um, but when we are trying to be inclusive, um, the true measure of whether we're successful at being inclusive is that anybody, no matter their diversity of background, feels like they belong. And so that's where we're really trying to get to with all of this. Um, I'm not gonna speak to decolonization again, but, I, um, um, but, it, but it's there. I do wanna share this quote. Um, so when we don't know each other's stories, we substitute our own myth about who that person is. So when we're operating with only a myth, none of that person's truth will ever be known to us and we'll injure them mostly without ever meaning to. So again, we all come from different diverse backgrounds. We all identify in different ways, um, 
but if we don't expose ourselves um, or have opportunity to immerse ourselves in different cultures, in different experiences, uh, we'll make some assumptions about that. So growing up, I was very fortunate that uh, my mom who adopted me um, was uh, an immigrant from uh, Germany. So growing up, we went back to her home country quite a bit uh, to visit her family. And so the culture in Germany uh, was very different than the culture in Canada. And so understanding um, and seeing that and being immersed in it gave me a, a fuller understanding of who my mom was and, and why she was the way that she was. She grew up in Germany post-World War um, and so came away with a lot of intergenerational trauma from that experience. Um, and so she carried that with her, but being able to go and be immersed in that culture helped me appreciate that. And us as engineers and students in a, in a world where it's very international, um, we need to be very careful of our conscious bias towards different experiences that are uh, outside of what we do here in Canada. And so this quote really talks to this idea of unconscious bias. So people identify in many different ways. This is an identity wheel um, and this is not everything, um, but it's important to realize what is important to the other person in terms of how they view themselves. And so um, often the cue to understand um, how people strongly identify is to listen to how they introduce themselves. So for me, of course, um, in your introduction, you heard um, it stated first that I'm from the Dene First Nation. So in indigenous uh, communities, kinship is so important. You introduce yourself starting with your family. You go through your family lineage. You talk about your grandmothers and who you're related to and um, the things that they learned and, and all of that. So kinship and family um, is so important. In some of the circles that I walk in, I would introduce myself by saying, my name is Jessica Vandenberg. My pronouns are she and her. Gender expression, gender identity, um, sexual orientation, especially for the LGBTQ2S um, plus community is so important these days. And so I know when I come into their world and their conversations, that how I identify my gender is very important. So I introduce myself that way. In the engineering world, the common practice is more the tie to career and academic accomplishment. So in other circles, I'll introduce myself. I'm Jessica Brandenburg, Assistant Dean, Engineering Community and Culture. Depending what people put credibility in, um, sometimes I'll throw out the patents that I have or the degrees that I have or the awards that have been awarded um, because that's what is important in those circles. And so really trying to understand how people identify will give that appreciation to understanding uh, why diversity, how to build inclusive environments for diverse demographics. All right, so um, just some surprising things in Canada when it comes to talking about inclusion, I wanna, I wanna bring up. So feel free to engage in the chat again. Um, do you know when women earned the chance to vote? And this is because of the advocacy work of the famous five. So of course, um, white settler men in Canada were able to uh, vote from the beginning, 1867. Uh, women earned the chance to vote, 1916. So 1922 is pretty close. Um, when did First Nations women earn a chance to vote? 1912, Manitoba, nice. So, um, sorry, the First Nations men earned a chance to vote, 1920. Um, First Nations women earned a chance to vote. Um, a few of you got this in the chat, 1960. So think about that. A hundred years later, after white settler men were able to vote, uh, First Nations women earned a chance to vote. So I'm just giving you data um, around some of the non-inclusion that's here within Canada. I'm out in the prairies here. You might not know the answer to this, but when did Calgary's Petroleum Club allow women to gain membership? And this is always interesting because um, here in Alberta, of course, we, we have a lot of oil and gas exploration um, and the Petroleum Club was a place where a lot of engineering deals went down. A lot of people went there, a few guesses there. 1989, so fairly close, not so long ago. Um, when were gay rights written into Canadian law? And again, for the LGBTQ2S uh, plus community, um, these, these movements are, are um, taking flight. We hear a lot happening in that space. Um, 
So we have a, a couple of answers in the chat, 1992, yeah, marriage is in 2004. A lot of different movement in terms of legislation um, to create, um, again, that place of equity um, for folks that um, identify in those ways. When did expecting mothers gain equality with regards to EI? Um, as someone who is a mother to two children, I um, had those children uh, in the middle of my career. Um, this one I always found was interesting. So men prior to this date would receive X amount from EI. If a woman went off to um, take leave to have her children and applied for EI, they would get half the amount that the men got when going on EI. So this one was in 1993. When did the last residential school close? Um, and this especially um, hits home, 1997, 1996, very close. Um, and especially today is an announcement will come um, at 2 p.m. my time, 1 p.m. Pacific time, um, about more bodies being found in Williams Lake First Nation. So the count in Canada for um, the residential school recoveries is in about the 7,000s now. So um, quite a bit of data around that not everything is uh, equal here in Canada. Not everything is um, as inclusive as sometimes we like to showcase to outside countries. All right, so as we understand, as we start opening ourselves up to understanding diversity and wanting to build inclusive places and places of belonging, it really starts with that internal kind of reflection on ourselves. So knowing yourself lets you understand others. And so understanding your own identifiers, the things that resonate with you, understanding your own biases, um, and just being aware of those things. Again, I was adopted, raised in a primarily uh, white German family, very strict Catholic. Um, I grew up in an environment where racism, discrimi discrimination, and prejudice was pretty alive, especially towards Indigenous people. And I didn't really realize that until I came to the University of Alberta where it exposed me to a lot of different ethnic backgrounds and a lot of different people. And I really started to start that exploration of my birth heritage and what that meant. Um, so it took me a long time to face some of the prejudices and discrimination and unconscious bias that I had towards my own people and really um, come to terms with that and, and shift uh, my behavior and my attitudes. Um, and that was a very eye-opening experience for sure. So one of the tools I like to share with people when they're starting their awareness journey is called the Joe Harry window. So one along the one axis is what you know about yourself and the other is what others know about you. And so um, there are things that I know about myself that you don't know about me. Um, maybe you didn't know that I play the accordion. And so now you know that. So now we've shifted over to the place where you know things about me and I know things about me. But there's also things that you know about me that I don't know about myself. And for me, I do a lot of 360 feedback with my teams. I always ask uh, my leaders to share um, their impressions of me. So that helps me see the things that I don't know. Um, in, one of the, in one of the places that I worked, uh, one of my leaders was uh, transitioning to another job. And I asked him that question and he said, well, you, you, you have this little tell, you have this little nervous piece of laughter that I know um, when, you, when I hear that, um, there's something that's on your mind. So just knowing those little things about myself helps me understand how to better communicate and better build strong relationships. And of course, the last window is there's things that you don't know and I don't know about myself that will be really uh, revealed over time <clears throat> or it won't. But for me, I really strive to get to a place of authenticity. And that is where the things that I know about myself are the same things that you know about me. And so as we talk about um, appreciating um, people in their true color and their true beauty and their true authentic selves, we do need to have this conversation about racism, discrimination and prejudice. First admitting that it is alive and active um, in many places in this world. And then um, having a look at ourselves to see if it is alive and active within, a, within ourselves as well. And so when I talk to folks about equity, diversity, inclusion, truth and reconciliation, I, I really love using this graphic um, because there's a fear zone, learning zone and growth zone. So there are people who are never ready for these conversations that um, would deny that there's an issue um, 
you know, from those folks, you hear arguments like, well, instead of Black Lives Matter, Indigenous Lives Matter, they say things like, uh, well, all lives matter, or I don't see color, um, things like that. So there's indicators that they're not quite ready for the conversation. Uh, most people I find are in this learning zone. So they know there are things there, they're not quite sure how to address it. Um, they're starting to have a look inside themselves and, and really grow and understand themselves. Um, and for those, especially in positions of privilege, this is a hard place to, to kind of be. Um, so they're grappling with some of the emotional response to this stuff. But this is a great place because they, they have that degree of awareness already. And so in conversations like this, uh, we can really help to shift folks towards that growth zone where you are actively um, seeking healing if you're an underrepresented demographic or um, a demographic that's being oppressed. Um, you understand the systems and you see what, what, what is there and, and what can help you um, to get back to healthy. If you are on the side of, of more privilege, um, then it's learning how to be an ally and, uh, and a support for those who are oppressed. Um, and this, um, the steps within the growth zone really do have to fit your personality. They don't have to be grand gestures. It can be little things like having a land acknowledgement at your meetings. It can be little things like um, sticking up for your friend. It can be little things like just simply reading a book on the subject or um, following certain people on social media or media um, in order to educate and be aware of things that are going on. So it's really this growth zone that we're trying to shift people to. And for me as an indigenous person, uh, I've been through a lot of very racist experiences. Some that have resulted in some pretty um, large diagnoses of PTSD that take decades to heal um, up to small things. But I'm always so grateful to the friends that speak out to me when I can't. Um, and I think back to a, um, for example, um, again, I mentioned skiing, I'm a very passionate skier. So we take these bus trips out to the mountains. I remember arriving in a small town and the hotel doors were locked because we arrived in the middle of the night. And the, the couple of folks in front of me said, um, I wonder why the doors are locked. And the buddy says to his friend, well, it's to keep out the drunk Indians. And um, things like that happen. And I get a little bit tongue-tied and I just don't know what to say. Um, but I'm so thankful when my friends close to me say something on my behalf. Um, and so my friends spoke up on my behalf. And I can name a number of these things. These things happen regularly. Um, and so I can think of a number of these things where I'm just so grateful for people who are in that growth zone. Um, the other part of the conversation, and I alluded to it in the last um, slide, is that the, there are a number of systems that we operate in, uh, governance systems, government systems, education systems, healthcare systems, all sorts of systems, and a lot of them are built to favor certain demographics, and this is a conversation around privilege, um, and it's okay to benefit from these systems, but understanding that there are those who don't benefit, that there are barriers. This is the, the part of the conversation that is important to realize and sometimes it's hard to grapple with. And so I'm gonna share with you um, a video. I'm just gonna switch the screens here. Make sure I share my sound. All right, here we go. Shoulder to shoulder, take off your backpacks. Basketball, line up, we're about to race. Hey, we are, we are racing for a $100 bill. The winner of this race will take this. It's a $100 bill. Before I say go, I'm going to make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. 
Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability. You don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I have said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because the reality is, if this was a fair race and everybody was back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly going to win this race called life. That is a picture of life, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now. When I say go, on your mark, get set, go. If you didn't learn anything from this activity, you're a fool. I'm just going to flip back to the slide back here. So it really points out that there are systems that are built in favor of certain demographics. And the idea of inclusion, again, is breaking down some of those barriers, understanding how to navigate those systems, building supports needed when um, you're still being oppressed within the systems that are built there. And especially for Indigenous people where it was um, a national effort for cultural genocide. The Indian Act was put in place um, shortly after Canada became a country, 1867, and it's still in effect today. And that is important to understand, especially for Indigenous peoples. Indigenous people, of course, have three large categories, very distinct cultural groups. We have our First Nations, of which there's um, 634 recognized within Canada. We know there's more than that each with its unique culture and language and, and beauty to it. Um, the Métis people, um, they weren't subject to the Indian Act, but they were oppressed in other ways. Their land was taken away. They were road allowance people, often uh, not walking in any world or welcome in any world, um, being called half-breeds. And that is not true. They have a beautiful culture and a beautiful background. And then we have the Inuit to the north um, who are often forgotten, but live a different world and have been oppressed in different ways too. And so a lot, of, a lot of work needs to be done in this space for truth and reconciliation as part of equity, diversity, inclusion work. And, but we really want to move towards that reciprocity. And so um, what can we do to start answering the calls to action today? So the role of professional engineers in truth and reconciliation. Professional engineers, again, are ethical in all actions, behaviors, working in the public interest. So really being thoughtful in your ethical behavior Sometimes that comes to a point where it's at odds with the company vision and where the company is going. And I've had a lot of these conversations with professional engineers, especially when I was at APEGA as director of um, 
um, enforcement and permits. A lot of people would call with um, situations where they just did not agree with company direction and they knew ethically that they couldn't walk in that way. And there are a number of professionals that would submit complaints, um, but also choose to leave those companies. Professional engineers need to be able to think through a variety of perspectives on impact in the risk assess uh, assessment planning and design stage of all engineering projects. Um, and again, that's being the voice for those who aren't at the table. Um, when I think through how you uh, in build inclusive spaces, you need to consider things like universal access design. You need to think about um, uh, spiritual rooms and meditation rooms, HVAC to help so that we can smudge in different places. You need to really think about creating the space to say to different demographics, is there something that we're missing here while we're planning? Is there something that we're missing here when we're about to begin construction? Do we need to think about the land? Um, I think about the engineering project here in Edmonton. We just recently built a bridge. Um, well, recently, within the last 10 years, we built a bridge where they discovered unmarked graves. If that had been thought about to ask that question, to do a traditional land use study at the beginning of that project, um, that, that wouldn't have come up where it did in the construction phase. So just making and pausing to ask the questions at different stages. Is there anything from a diversity perspective that we need to think about? And tools like gender-based analysis plus are intended to um, give you the ability to put on different hats and know when to pause and ask those questions. Equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization are essential to mitigating risks and fully understanding the impact of engineering decisions and projects to foster innovation. So we know there is a business case for diversity. We know the capability is there. It's building those inclusive environments um, so that we can bring the right people to the table. We know any engineering pro uh, project has an impact to people. Even though when you're designing a valve, you're designing instrumentation, um, you get lost in the math and the science, um, you might not always think um, outside of the impact to the outside world and the community, but there is an impact. There's an impact to environment, there's an impact to communities. There's a long lasting impact. Indigenous people, we think in seven generations. What the, how does this impact people seven generations from now? And I think about things like the giant mine in the Northwest Territories and the, the years that are needed to um, repair the land that has been damaged by that mine. Um, recognizing that Canada does have ingrained impression in its legislation frameworks and policy um, throughout industry, educational institutions, religions, uh, religious organizations, legal systems, governance system, understanding that that exists and acknowledging that is important. So as you grow into leaders, how can you implement change? Real change that really affects that legislation governance change that will shift that oppression that's built into some of these systems. Know that the calls to action are for everyone, um, everyone. And so that's all the way from doing little things like just reading a book by an Indigenous author, buying all your Christmas people from uh, Christmas presents from local craftspeople, uh, making space for smudges, um, things like that, little small things, which will give you the confidence to later do bigger things. But all the little things add up. And again, for us at the University of Alberta here, we um, as an institution, educational institution, are committed to truth and reconciliation. And so seeing those commitments within strategic plans just warms my heart so much. And I know the University of Toronto is dedicated to this. This whole um, series that, you're, that we're kicking off today is all part of this. So um, there's so many wonderful steps in terms of reconciliation that I've seen, um, and it gives me some great hope. So that's where I wanted to end today. Um, so hopefully that gave you a lot of food for thought. You're welcome to reach out at any time. Uh, follow me on social media, I post things all the time. Um, but I'll hand it back to uh, take a few questions to take us to the end of the hour here. Thank you so much, Jessica, for the engaging and thought-provoking talk. Really appreciate it. I wanted to start by sharing, uh, Jessica mentioned this in the chat, she actually sent some resources in advance and I put those on my University of Toronto OneDrive, which I just put the link in the chat and maybe I'll type it a couple of times because it'll disappear, but there's a couple of PDFs there with follow-up resources. You're getting swamped by the, the thank yous for this great talk. <laughs> You're welcome, <laughs> it's always a pleasure. <laughs> And so, yes, we have about a few minutes for questions with Jessica. Um, I'll invite you to raise your hand and only unmute if I ask you to unmute or else you're welcome to type out a chat here uh, and we can read it.
And I know, and again, I don't know where everybody's starting their journey. Um, some of these concepts might be new, some of them you might be familiar with. Um, and I know it takes courage to take that first truth and recon uh, reconciliation step. Like even just getting used to saying land acknowledgements uh, is, is a big step. Um, thinking through it and what it means, thinking about the land that you're on um, or walking with an indigenous person, um, going to historic sites, um, educating yourself. Uh, there, there's so many places where you can start um, you can start this journey. Oh, I see a question. What is my favorite ski resort? I love Kicking Horse is my favorite. Um, the view of a thousand peaks, uh, you can see the mountain range, you can see for miles. And how can you not believe in um, creator and God and land spirit, mother earth, whatever it is you want to believe in when you stand up and you see something like that. It's just stunning. Jessica, you have a question here. Any suggestions on how to engage with indigenous people without being a burden? For sure, definitely. Um, so just don't ask anything. <laughs> don't ask anything of the Indigenous people. Just be their friend and, and chat with them and walk with them. Um, I know tokenism is one thing people are very conscious of, um, and as well as um, putting the burden on Indigenous people to lead these conversations. Um, it, you do need the lived experience to really uh, shift people from the learning zone to the growth zone. Um, but often it's just checking in with the person. Are you doing okay? Am I being a burden? Uh, just ask the question. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to invite uh, Professor Jason Basilak to unmute and ask his question. Hi, Jessica. Um, Hi. I loved your talk. Um, part of a, a lot of what you were talking about, or some of what you were talking about, was about what people can do and I love your start small you know because you can get people can get overwhelmed right um, I think another obstacle uh, that I see in many of my uh, colleagues I consider allies is um, they want to do something but they're afraid they're afraid of offending somebody they're afraid of getting it wrong so they don't do it all do you have any suggestions on for because I get this asked all the time like I want to do something but I'm you know, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to mispronounce it or, or, or bigger. Do you have any suggestions for those people who are, are my, uh, want to engage more but are afraid? For sure. Thank you, Jason. And it's great to see you again. Um, from the side of that, uh, I mentioned the seven sacred teachings. It's really taking into the teaching of humility and as well as the engineering mindset that it's okay to try things um, and have to course correct. And so how, how do you do that? You ask for feedback. Um, did I do that right? Did I pronounce it right? Or just start from the beginning that I'm new to pronunciation. I'm going to do my best, um, but here it goes. And you, you give it a whirl. Um, and often these things feel overwhelming from the beginning, um, but in actuality, they're not. Um, and again, as an Indigenous person, anybody attempting to speak uh, my language, which I don't speak, um, but, um, or does a land acknowledgement or does a gesture that comes from an authentic place makes me feel like reconciliation is happening, right? Um, and keep in mind, this is what I tell people as well. You're not gonna do worse than an oppressive piece of legislation called the Indian Act, which is in effect today. You're not gonna do worse than that. <laughs> so just trying something, um, the only thing that can come out of it is confidence for you to continue trying that and something that is heartwarming for me. So give it a go. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, Professor Lisa Romke has a question. I'll let her unmute. Thank you so much. Can you, oh, you can hear me good. <laughs> Thank you so much for that excellent talk. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, and I just have a question that I think is um, related actually to what Professor Basilak um, just mentioned, but maybe a more specific kind of question within that sort of <laughs> um, umbrella or under that umbrella. So. Um, I teach a uh, impact of technology on society and the environment course with Professor Rob Irish. And within the course, we um, cover engineering ethics. Um, but I think one of the dilemmas with some of the ethics that are often taught, you know, in North American um, engineering schools is that um, they don't do a great job of acknowledging environmental actors or what we sometimes try to refer to as more than human actors. So we've started bringing in um, Indigenous ethics frameworks, because there is this acknowledgement of the reciprocity between human and the environment. 
And we bring in Indigenous authors to support this. Um, but I sometimes kind of wonder about my own ability, I guess, to share this and talk about it with the class as someone who is, you know, a white settler. So I just wonder if you have any guidance or thoughts to share, or maybe things that we can do to ensure that we're doing this in the right, in the right way and in the best way, and that we're, you know, making the considerations that we need to make when it comes to actually teaching some of this and bringing it into our teaching. Thank you. Good question, and, and thanks for that. And I'm glad that you extended your conversation to uh, more than just people, because again, um, this idea of all my relations is the heart of that um, of, of that teaching for sure. Um, for me, definitely, um, what I've noticed is COVID has given us an interesting opportunity. So previously, of course, elders would teach mainly oral, uh, orally, um, but a lot of elders have put their teachings online. Um, so you can engage with elder voices. Um, elder Dave Co uh, Cochran was a, a great elder. He passed away about a month ago who did a lot of teachings in terms of land spirit and mother earth. And the, he has a lot of wonderful videos uh, that are available online for those teachings. But also of course, just inviting the elder our knowledge keeper themselves to the class to talk directly about what is, what is all my relations? What does that actually mean? Um, and of course you can't, um, learn everything in, in a small class. This talk is just a glimmer and a glimpse in, into these things. Um, it takes a lifetime to learn these lessons, but um, bringing in um, indigenous, um, indigenous elders and knowledge keepers is a great place to start or using their teachings that they make available online, but also understanding how to honor those people for sharing their teachings as well. So even if they're sharing online, um, please do give a donation on their behalf or in their honor or um, offer protocol or or offer the medicines to the earth yourself um, in appreciation for what has been taught. Thank you so much. That's really, really helpful. Thank you. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're at time in Professor Vandenberg's talk. Um, I see there were some questions we didn't get to in the chat. And so I do welcome those folks to keep looking for those answers. Um, take a look at the resources that Professor Vandenberg left for us and the resources at the University of Toronto. Uh, thank you all for being here. We have recorded the talk. And so once we figure out the right medium for sharing that, we'll be in touch with you as attendees. And again, I just really want to thank Professor Vandenberg here today. Uh, really, this is the perfect first seminar. It's a really important topic, and we were honored to have you share today. So thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. It was an honor and a um, pleasure for sure. And from my heart and spirit to yours, I wish you the best. Thank you.